Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's so lovely to have everybody here uh, for this uh, community leadership panel discussion. Um, and, um, you know, we have um, some awesome community leaders here, and I'm going to be introducing the three of them. Uh, we'll start with uh, Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Lance Senna. She was born and raised in Albuquerque and received both her bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in health administration from the University of New Mexico and has worked in health policy and advocacy um, and in a lot of, of contributed to a lot of policies before her position as a city councilor. So welcome Councilwoman Senna. We then have Dr. Kiran Katira who is of a very interesting descent. She's East African Asian Indian woman. She was born in Kenya and raised in England. And she received a PhD in educational thought and socioeconomic studies at the University of New Mexico. And for many years, she has worked with local community organizers and leaders through the UNM's Community Engagement Center. She facilitates the growth and development of diverse students who apprentice with strong community leaders. And she also teaches university co courses focusing on anti-racist education, peace, justice, and multicultural education. Welcome, Dr. Katira. We have Maria Eleli Colon, who is currently an avid MESA and math teacher at Van Buren Middle School. This is her 20th year of teaching at this school. And she has a philosophy of teaching. It's uh, anchored on uh, inquiry. She believes that teachers and students can le learn from each other all the time. And she has won numerous teaching awards. Um, and um, she is actually from the Philippines. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering in the Philippines and a Master's in Secondary Education in Math, Science, and Technology. So our great uh, three great leaders. I'm so looking forward to this discussion. And let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Sangeeta Prabhakran. I'm a surgical oncologist and a translational researcher at the University of New Mexico, We're focusing on genomic diversity, contributing to outcomes in breast cancer. But, um, so we can, um, so I'm, I'm gonna provide some bios. Um, uh, I'm gonna provide some instructions for this uh, Q&A. We're going to be focusing on mainly uh, three major areas or actually four major areas to include the, the perception of the model minority, uh, forever foreigner, and the tricultural myth. And also we're going to explore how these areas relate to health inequities um, and statistically insignificance. It is a term we're going to learn about today. It has been a great learning experience for me just learning about these. So we can, we can go on to this program. So we have the first question and I'm gonna invite each of our leaders to talk about their professional and personal journeys that led to become a leader within the community and specifically wanted to ask them about their mentor and role model. We'll start with uh, Dr. Katira. Thank you, thank you, Sangeeta, and thank you, everyone. Um, so um, I would say I'll start with who my role model is because that is the most important piece for me. Um, and that's my dad and he's passed away now, but he, he was a very fearless, courageous, loving, joyful man who um, came from poverty, had a middle-class education, worked in a factory, um, but did everything he could to advocate for the rights of others. And I think one of the most memorable moments for me was how he stood up um, um, against someone in the community um, regarding um, domestic violence uh, against one of the young women. And so, yeah, my dad. Um, and I guess the journey begins there, right? But um, I've, I've been very fortunate in that um, I grew up in different countries. And so I got to experience different ways of being. And I would say that that journey led me 
And some of it was, part of it was forced migration that led to a backlash in the first country that I went to, which was England. And that backlash taught me a lot, right? There was so many lessons about how we were othered and violently othered and um, how a, um, a community came together, um, a cross-racial community to really advocate for us. And these early lessons on what racism does to families and how there can be cross-racial movements for pushing back on that um, have stayed with me all through my life. So I would say um, those early days have stayed with me and given me um, purpose in my life. As And so almost everything I do is tied to that. What a compelling story. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kiran. And uh, we're going to next ask Aleli to share her thoughts, her story. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. And um, I would also start with my role model. My role model was my mother. And she is somebody that always was on the go. I never understood that as a child. All I can think of is, why don't you just stay at home like every other mother? And my mother goes, I need to go out there and I need to help those who cannot help themselves. themselves. So um, she was my role model. She still is my role model until now. And mentor-wise, I have a lot of mentors. In every step of the way, somehow somebody is there that is a mentor to me. So, And I thank them for that all the time. And... Um, in terms of leadership in the community, I don't really see myself as a leader. I just see myself as a teacher. And um, it presented to me to advocate for others. I didn't really, you know, sought out for it. Um, so I don't, as, as I said earlier, I don't see myself as a leader. I just see myself as somebody that is there that would advocate particularly to my students in the international district. So I started out just a teacher and from there, um, somehow one way or another, maybe because of the connections that I have, I, I felt that I needed to go out and I need to advocate for them and help them reach their goals and be where they want to be, however I can. That's what I have. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go to Councilwoman Senna. And she. all the leaders have graciously agreed to let me use their first name. So I'm going to be calling her Lan. Lan, we want to hear your story. Yeah, thank you. And I'm also very honored to be on a panel um, among strong Asian American women. Um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and that kind of ties into my role model as well as being my mom. Um, having heard her story and her journey coming to Albuquerque as a refugee from Vietnam um, and my, my father as well. Um, they were both refugees and coming to Albuquerque and their story really shaped how I um, draft policies today um, and also made me think back later on in life um, what I can be doing to help others. So. Um, my personal and professional journey really started, um, I guess, technically when I was four. Um, in 1994, my grandfather was diagnosed with uh, kidney cancer. And because he was a green card holder, uh, we couldn't afford his, um, his cancer treatment. So my grandfather, rather than having a household of 16, be um, homeless he decided to not go through chemotherapy and uh, passed away. So when I was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma um, at the age of 21, I thought back to him and how um, policies really shaped how um, each generation of my family would live or not. Um, even though I'm still 10 years later, still battling um, my cancer, um, each time it's come back, Actually, our family has actually had to question um, over and over again our financial stability. So, so through each time, it's really made me um, think about others and how I would never want um, another family to go through what we're going through. Um, and 
um, and not just in healthcare, uh, but housing stability, food insecurity. Um, and so that's what's really driven me um, to my profession in policy. Uh, as I always tell my doctor, uh, I know that he tries to save me as an oncologist, but really it's through policy that through uh, a mark of a pen can save millions. Absolutely. And all of these issues are, they impact so many New Mexicans and many people in the world. And thank you so much for sharing that very courageous story of yours. And thank you for your service. So we're going to talk, um, I think we'll, we'll do the questions to the panel first, and then we'll leave it open for um, everybody to um, uh, ask questions. Um, this is the second question, and uh, we're going to go through this with our panel. How has the model minority perception impacted the AAPI community? Again, and how does this relate to health inequities? Um, we can go with um, Aleli. Do you wanna share your thoughts on this? Um, this was one question that I wasn't sure how to answer. <laughs> so model minority, I suppose I always think about like as an Asian person, there's always that um, thinking that, oh, you're Asian, you must be good in math. Oh, you're Asian and you must be skinny or you must be very active. And those are not necessarily true. And for me, it has, the misconceptions are difficult because, and I've seen it with some of my students, um, any minority students that I have, I've seen it with them. And, you know, it's hard to explain to a child to say, you are who you are. Don't let them, you know, define you. You define yourself. Because I think the pressure is really hard. And, and I saw that with my son. It was hard for him. And he told me one time and he said, mom, you don't understand. And I said, what don't I understand? He said, because I'm part Asian, I'm expected to excel in mathematics. And I didn't really think much about it, but then after a while I said, that is very true. Because even with, you know, it, it's hard to stay in that pedestal. And that pressure can really push and it can be very, very hard to deal with. And so I think um, being careful with looking at a person because of where they are from, of being Asian, of being Latino, of be looking at them, looking at a person as an individual. And I think that's very, very important to always remember that no matter what, that person comes with something special and they bring with them their specialness and the gifts that they have. They don't need to be Asian, they don't need to be white, they don't need to be African American, they don't need to, be, you know, we are all unique, because that pressure really gives that ump <laughs> that's difficult to get over with sometimes. Absolutely. So I mean, of all our panelists, I think you're the one who sees, um, you know, who teaches um, children and this pressure is on them even at that in, in childhood, right? Thank you. Um, how about um, Lan? Do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, you know, I, I think it's really important to recognize where model minority came from and how it's, it's a myth um, really coming out of the civil rights era um, to say that, oh, you know, um, Asian American Pacific Islander communities have faced oppression, and yet, you know, there's always that next statement, and yet, or but, you know, they're doing great. Um, and so through that myth, um, it has really compounded um, health inequities, whether it's um, domestic violence, um, we're seeing now, especially um, through Asian hate, a rise of 150% 
and hate crimes being reported. I think since last March, um, over 6,000 incidents have been reported and that's what's been reported. We don't know quite yet of what's being unreported. Um, and that's something that as a city councilor, definitely seeing um, from community and how it reverberates throughout um, saying like, oh, you know, they won't come forward. And that's part of the model minority myth is that they won't speak up uh, because of it. And also a lot of times, um, even through the rise of um, hate and violence that we've seen, it's been targeted um, to women. And that's part of the model minority as well, is that um, women are subservient or they won't speak up. And I think even just watching me on council, that's not true. Um, I think I can say that um, of our panelists as well, right? Um, so breaking through a lot of these perceptions and how it is deadly um, that people are actually dying because of this myth. Um, so it's not just in domestic violence or the violence and discrimination that we're seeing. It's also like um, how I was misdiagnosed for a year, for example, because my primary care physician was not um, taking my um, issues seriously. You know, having a persistent cough for a year turns out that 90% of my lungs were actually covered in tumors and a simple chest x-ray would have revealed that but instead he just kept pushing it off and saying, oh, you know, you're just making a fuss of this, you know, just be quiet and take your inhaler. Um, so, you know, it, it has led to an income uh, or uh, an outcome uh, that I'm still dealing with 10 years later. Um, who knows, you know, how my um, cancer would have progressed or not had I gotten proper care, but it's, it's these perceptions of the modern minority Myths and how it not just hurts us as uh, Api community members, but also hurting others, um, our Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, um, you know, being able to stand next to them and say that we've been facing these challenges too, and we, we're standing in solidarity with you. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that, you know, especially its effect on healthcare and you're you're absolutely right you know like your diagnosis being delayed or um, you know the certain minorities or certain communities not getting pain medications because of perceptions you know has been um, has been it's studies have shown that um, all the time do you feel that this has been divisive because when you look at something like the model minority concept you would think, oh, someone's praising that, that community, but you're actually saying that there is something negative about that, negative impact to the same community. Um, Kiran, could you please uh, share your thoughts? Yeah, that's where my thoughts would go. <laughs> so I want to agree with what um, Lan and Elia said, but um, I would definitely say there's so much problematic um, sort of nuances about that myth. Um, even like, just think about it, model minority, being called a minority in the first place, right? That terminology um, is just um, technically um, inappropriate since um, we make up a majority of the planet, right? So people of color are a majority of the planet. Asians is about 66%, right, of the planet. And so um, us alone, we cannot be called a minority, right? And um, to be called a model minority means it's in comparison to other, right? And what it does is it puts down other people of color. And what that's going to do is um, it's almost like saying to them, why can't you be like these good little Asians, right? And do like they do. And that is so... Um, you know, derogatory, it's condescending, it's everything. Or, um, and what it does is it causes a rift also between all other people of color and Asians. And that rift then manifests in how they see us or not see us as part of the um, fight for equity and justice and all the rest of it. Um, because um, of that myth, we are seen as trying to be white, right? And to be closer to white. And so, um, yes, it's very problematic. And if you take the data, right, Lan went to the data, disaggregate 
any of um, you know, the population within the Asian community, um, and you do it by class, you do it by um, gender, you'll do it by social, um, yeah, you'll do it by um, any, you know, whether they're immigrant, um, forced migration or, you know, immigrants that chose to come, you disaggregate all of the data and you will see that we fare just as bad as other groups who have had similar experience, right? So if you look at um, disaggregated data, you will see that in the education system, right, um, you look at Vietnamese or Hmong and how they're doing compared to other groups, right? And, um, and we're not faring well at all. But then you compare Indians to that population and yes, we're doing well, but that has everything to do with immigration and nothing to do with us in terms of being better at math or anything else, right? It's everything to do with the sifting and sorting that has uh, led to the certain groups coming to this country who have privilege, who have access, and then their children are gonna have privilege and access and suddenly the numbers start looking like, oh, why can't you be like the Indians or the Chinese? And that has everything to do with immigration and not anything to do with us being better than. So yeah, so the uh, model minority myth is um, pervasive. It affects healthcare, education, all the social determinants of health as well, right? Everything that you can think of. So um, yeah, it's hurting us all, every single one of us. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for those unique perspectives. So yes, it's, it's been more divisive um, than especially in the region of health inequities, as Lan said, you know, do, do you see this more? I mean, how does this, what is the real impact of this perception on the health inequities? Uh, Karen? So in health inequities, you're definitely, and this gets to what Lan said, right? There is this understanding that um, people have of research that's done on certain populations. And for the Asian population, because of the model minority myth, there isn't going to be that much emphasis put on research or um, working with or, you know, looking at those populations. But I would also say, um, and, and in New Mexico, it's tied to other parts of the um, questions you're going to ask as well um, in terms of our numbers, right? And so we're ignored in all sorts of ways. But the other um, piece with the model minority myth is not only that we're um, doing okay, it's also um, the, the notion that, um, um, and this goes back to what Lan said, not enough um, of us are given voice or given representation, and then nobody else is standing up for us or giving us voice or representation. And so, this, um, this leads to the notion of they're doing fine in all aspects of health. But I, I would say, um, do not look solely at health care. That would not give the fuller picture. If we don't look at the public health perspective of the social determinants, then we'd be missing uh, all the things that impact the health, ultimately the health of that person, right? So even if it is lack of scholarships, right? So you're not gonna have um, at UNM any um, you know, category that says, oh, okay, cause you're Vietnamese and we know about the disparities that Vietnamese um, have experienced in this country, you will have a scholarship. No, you're Asian. And so there'll be nothing for the Asians and definitely other groups of Asians should not be getting scholarships, right? They're, they have all sorts of privilege and power. And, um, so it shouldn't be Asians as a whole getting um, scholarships. I know that conversation is happening around the nation and that's, that's awful too, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but the people that need a scholarship, right, should be receiving a scholarship and they're not because they're seen as, oh, okay, they're doing fine. They don't need any support system financially or otherwise. Now, how does that impact that student? They no longer are able to financially stay in school, which will impact their ability to finish school, which will impact their um, future life earnings, as well as their family's stability, right? Economically and all of that. So I would say go for social um, determinants of health <laughs> to really look at the large impact. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's also a lack of data in a lot of things, including mm-hmm. health. I mean, um, being in the health sector, and I can say that, you know, one of my studies is health disparities, but the, yes, getting everybody together into the term Asian, yes, there's a lot of disparities within this group that is not clearly recognized. So thank you for sharing that perspective. So we'll go on to the next question and ask our panel, in what way has the stereotype forever foreigner impacted you? And what are the strategies or actions to overcome that stereotype? And more importantly, because this is not only to understand, but also to help, how can the AAPI allies help? Uh, We could start with uh, Lan. Do you wanna take this first? Yeah, sure. I uh, have been thinking through this one um, and I will say this impacted me at a very young age uh, where my teachers constantly recommended to my parents uh, that I take ESL um, and uh, being born and raised in Albuquerque um, and navigating education was so frustrating to me because of that. Um, and uh, teachers constantly telling me, you know, well, maybe you shouldn't opt in for that career. Maybe you should think about something else, um, you know, and saying like, oh, you know, your, your um, English isn't that great. So we recommend to do something else, uh, maybe not go into law or go into politics. Um, and I didn't think back to it until much later you know, not even seeing um, Asian American teachers. And that's why I love that Aleli is also on this panel because, you know, we we want to see role models and we want to see people in professions where we can see ourselves in as well. Uh, But on the the flip side to that, uh, a teacher was actually the one that pushed me really um, for my passion in politics. So, you know, there's two different spectrums of that for the forever foreigner that in in New Mexico, Asian Americans have been here since the 19th century, um, and yet we're still considered an other. Um, and when we, even, I know this will be touched on in the next question, but it's, you know, we're not counted as part of the, the fabric of New Mexico. Um, it's, it's always like, oh, yes, but... Um, you know, and I, I keep raising that as to my response to the previous question because that constantly is coming up for our community. You know, that, oh, well, sure, you guys uh, need a community center, but, you know, so it, it's constantly those types of remarks. And I think that goes back to how allies can help um, is combating these stereotypes that you hear, combating these myths that you hear. Um, and saying that um, that we're a part of the integral uh, community of New Mexico and um, the forever foreigner is definitely being uh, perpetuated now through COVID, through um, uh, some of the, the discrimination and the hate that we're seeing now as well. Um, and I hoped that for my nieces and our younger generation that it would end, but I feel that because of just the way we look is going to push us to constantly be seen as that forever foreigner, that somehow we won't be able to assimilate because we don't look like everybody else. And so I think that that's how it be so harmful Um, and ways that, again, communities can help is really think through that but also understand the history of New Mexico and how Asian Americans arrived here. Um, I think that that would definitely help break a lot of, not just the model minority, uh, but even going to the next question, the trisocial myth and the forever born. Thank you. Aleli? So um, thank you, Lan, for recognizing that. it is true that I'm one of the few, but not anymore because there's a lot of Filipino teachers now <laughs> that was brought in here, but they're only here for five years and then they're going to go back. So um, one of the things that somehow I, I, I suppose I carry it with a badge of pride. Like, yes, I am a foreigner, 
but that doesn't mean I'm lower than you. I'm as good as you are, basically is how I take it. So some of my students do ask me about it. Like, so Mrs. Colon, um, you're not American. You're not Native American. What are you? And so I tell them, I'm a person. I'm your teacher. Just like you're a person, you're a student. But um, it is true that um, I don't look American at all. And um, I, I suppose I always want to tell my students, I always go back to my students because that's who I deal with all the time, is that be proud of who you are because wherever you're from, those are your roots and you will always go back to your roots. And um, what's sad is that um, this happened to me as a teacher. One parent told me, my daughter can't understand you because you have a very heavy accent. And I said, I, I am sorry I have a heavy accent. I will do my very best that your child can hear and understand what I am saying. Um, I don't speak very fast, but I think one of the things that is out there that hurts a lot, not just Asians, but anybody who speaks another language that has a heavy accent, they're considered not as intelligent as those that speak, you know, American English. And that's sad for me. I feel bad for them. I don't feel bad for myself because yes, I live in America, but I will always be Filipino by heart. And I'm proud of that. And um, being recognized as a human being is what I ask for. And I don't ask for anything else. And that's what I tell my students all the time. You will treat people the way you, the way you want to be treated. And you are a human being and you have a history and your roots are important and recognize everybody else around you because they come from somewhere. So that's, so I, I, I suppose what I could say is that, um, um, the allies can, can work together in terms of showing our uniqueness and showing what we have, the similarities that we have, the struggles, the triumphs, the celebrations that we have because they're all unique. And it's, it is who we are. And I think that New Mexico is very unique in a lot of ways because there's so many of us. And I am sad to say, just like Lan said, that there are a lot of Asians here and we are not even, we're, we're considered the teeny tiny group of minority, but you're not a minority, you know? And that's hard to take because there's more of us than just a teeny tiny part, I believe. That was so moving and thank you for sharing that and being a great role model because you are influencing students for the good the most formative years of their lives when they are, you know, thinking, you know, and I, I do believe you're helping them to look at another human being and actually accept the human being as a whole. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, Kiran, your yeah, take. You. Yeah, thank you, Aleli. And um, Lan, I definitely agree with what both of you have said. And um, I would add that um, it's tied to immigration policies and policies and rhetoric and the media. And so um, sometimes an individual can do so much, right? When it comes to Forever Foreigner, it's like if, if the history books never showed that we've been here since the 19th century or even the 18th century in California, right? So if the history books don't show that, um, if the policies um, immigration policies in particular, right, are often doing things like bringing in um, teachers when we need them from the Philippines, but then once, um, you know, five years and they have to go back, right? Um, immigration policy throughout American history has done this to Asians, right, and to other groups, but definitely um, the forever foreigner goes back to immigration policies in the U.S. And so we need to understand that history so that we don't put everything on the teacher or the individual, right? That's trying to 
um, be resilient and resist, right? Resiliency and resistance um, usually comes when everything else is failing, right? So that's where we shouldn't go to that and expect that from every child to just care that, carry that burden of like, um, you know, and, and this comes from personal experience too, right? So this is the whole notion that, you know, um, a Kenyan, um, you know, first, right? So born in Kenya, but obviously do not look Kenyan um, to others, right? Um, England next, definitely do not look English. America for 25 years, definitely don't look American. And, um, and the, the question there is, what does that um, American look like, right? So even saying that I don't look American adds to the problem in some ways, right? saying I don't look Kenyan, saying I don't look British or English, right, um, is all part of it. And that most of the media portrays what an American is or who American is, it's not this, right, with this accent or with this look, right? And so that is adding to the problem. And that is why we're constantly seen as forever foreigner. And what can be done about it? Definitely all of the things mentioned, right? So policies need to change. History books need to change. Curriculum in schools, right? Ethnic studies needs to be the norm so that we know each other's history, right? It's not just good enough for me to know about my history. Everybody needs to know about Asian history, because Asian American history, because it's actually American history, right? And so ethnic studies needs to be there. Um, more cross-racial coalitions. I know I keep going back to that, but if we don't see each other's liberation in each other and we just fight for our own group, we're never going to get anywhere, right? So we have to have to work across those differences and uniquenesses. And, um, and I think there are some strengths to being um, not from here, but I feel for someone like my niece, right? So I have that notion of, I know, you know, my family in Kenya, my family in India, my family in England, I have those roots, right, all over the planet. But um, what happens to my niece, right, who, um, you know, she's, she's 14 years old, and I've heard her say things like, um, I tell my school friends that I'm Kenyan and, um, and she's not, so she's a generation away from Kenya, but she's trying to grasp at something, right? So what are her roots if she's, you know, um, walking in this world in America where she's getting the messages, you're not American, you're not American. So she's grasping at what is she? And so, yeah, I would say to work with our young ones to say embrace your what I would call polyculturalism is what I've been trying to talk to her about and say that we are all polycultural and we have, you know, parts of different experiences. And that's the richness we bring and to understand what our and who our ancestors are and what our ethnicity is and what, you know, what our nationalities are and all of those different identities matter. And it's convoluted, but the more a young person gets to experience that from a very young age, um, they're actually going to have better behavioral mental health, right? Because otherwise, they're grasping at things. Thank you, Kiran. And uh, yeah, let me go on to the next question. And then I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, the, the audience has, an has questions, so we're going to answer those. So here's the next question. And for some states and communities, the tricultural myth still exists. What are the challenges for the AIPI community to not be included? And how have each of you helped the AIPI community overcome this? So the tricultural myth. Um, let's go with um, Aleli this time. I was trying to hide. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the one of the things I, I believe that I, I'm speaking from my experience as a Filipino coming here in the United States, I've decided as a young, as a young woman at that time, I'm just going to be in the background. I'm never going to lead. I'm just going to be in the background. I'm in a new country. I can be insignificant. So one of the things Filipinos are very good at is that they're very humble. They, um, we Filipinos don't want the focus to be on us. Um, we want it, we, we, 
project it back to whoever gave it to us. Hence the reason why when, you, you know, Filipinos are overlooked, they say, oh, it's okay, it's no big deal. But deep inside, it is a big deal. But we cannot ever show that. <laughs> because if you show that, then you become boastful in your com own community. Oh, look at so-and-so, very, very boastful. When in fact, in reality, you earned that whatever praise that one was that you were supposed to have, and it was never, ever recognized. So that humbleness sometimes is considered as bragging, as um, there's a term we're in. It's kind of like, no, I'm not that good. I'm not that good, even though you are very good. So that is one thing that I think that, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to overcome. Even I, as an adult, I have to tell myself, yes, I'm good enough. Yes, I have done that. But it's still hard to accept because I'm, I'm still at the back of my mind. I'm still afraid, like, am I bragging too much? What will, what will my neighbors say? You know, and <laughs> that's one. And another one is that um, everything has to be personal. You don't say anything outside of the family, your health, however good you are, however buffed you are, however sick you are, you never ever say that outside of the family. That stays within the family. And I think that's one thing that's very difficult that, and not to ask for help because so afraid of being looked at as weak, looked at as if, um, you know, they can't hack it. <laughs> basically is what we would say in the Philippines. You can't hack it, so don't be saying anything. Keep it within the family. It's kind of like the family secret. And mind you, the family is extended family, not your immediate family, that the father, mother, the children. No, that goes to your grandparents. That's your family. Those are the only people that can know. So I think that's, you know, um, that's how we tend to be somehow we, we stay in the background. Mm -hmm. And um, how have I helped? I don't know if I have helped. I suppose I, I, I do it with my students. Again, I go back to my students. I do it with my students. I, I boost them. I tell them, yes, you're worthy. Yes, you worked for this. And yes, you should have it. And you are good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I, I go with it. And it still is a challenge on my part in, uh, because again, there's that, you know, background noise at the back that says, you're bragging, stop <laughs> bragging, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of what comes to mind. <laughs> you serve each and every day, Aleli, thank you. Uh, Kiran, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go next. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, so the tricultural myth is the whole notion that um, in the state of New Mexico, in particular, this happens here for sure. Um, there is this notion that it's only the Native American, Latinx and white populations here. And the Asian and black populations are considered, um, and the term is used, statistically insignificant. So they're often considered not, um, the numbers aren't large enough for to be even thought of, right? And to start be studied or to um, be included or to be represented or any of that, right? So the numbers are too low. And, um, and that is um, um, a real travesty because what it does is it invisibilizes Asians and black people, right? And I, I can't even imagine being black in the world right now and what it must mean to be invisibilized in New Mexico. So, yeah. But I would say um, what we can do is storytelling and, um, and for trying to get more and more of us to, and this is where um, Aleli, I think I 100% I understand your sentiment because um, I, you know, this, the whole notion of 
putting yourself forward and speaking up and saying your story or sharing with the world that we exist is not necessarily um, a good thing in our culture, right? We're not supposed to be um, going around talking about yourself all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think um, more of that is needed though, but I think it is um, to try to have the histories and the um, data and all of that representation as part of making sure that people know we exist, right? And, and maybe it also means understanding that, um, you know, the, the global context and the national context needs to be understood as well and not to think of ourselves in New Mexico in this bubble or a vacuum, right? Um, we are part of a nation. We are part of a, a global community. And um, so, yeah, those, those are the ways I think we can do that. Thanks, Karen. So, Lan, uh, if you can make your comments brief, then we'll open this up to the audience. Sure. I mean, I, it was mentioned before, you know, I want to definitely touch on this. Um, as Kiran was saying, that it ties a lot to immigration policy. You know, why is it that we have such a small population? Well, think of the Chinese Exclusion Act that prohibited Chinese from immigrating to America. Think of Page's Law. Think of our own constitution in New Mexico, the Alien Land Act that prohibited Asian Americans from owning property. Um, even still, to this day, we have racist covenants in our own neighborhoods that say, um, and I quote, Orientals and Blacks cannot live on the property unless you're slaves. So we think back to, okay, why exactly are these populations small? Um, and if we think about it in terms of COVID, just think if those statistically significant populations just perished, that's 3%, 6% of our state population. And that's why we have to really invest in these communities, thinking about why we need language access, for example, and saying, oh, well, you know, um, the Chinese American community or the Vietnamese community is so small, why should we translate this? Well, it's thinking of the detriment and health uh, and public health of not just our um, Api community, but overall state population. And we're definitely seeing that now through COVID. And I think, you know, partly how um, overcoming this is voting, definitely very important, um, and running for office. Uh, for me, being the first Asian American, Asian American woman, daughter of refugees, it's so important. Um, to our community that's saying that, wow, representation does matter, whether it's in politics, whether it's as a teacher or a professor, um, just how important it is for our community. So I think that uh, that's part of the um, solution, but it's also telling our other communities and our decision makers that our lives are worth it, that these investments are critical. Um, although that you may see us as, as statistically insignificant, um, that we are making these contributions and we are um, part of New Mexico, we are part of this state and our lives are worth it. Thanks, Len. Um, I think we can proceed with the questions and if you can please type your questions into the chat, that would be great. And while we are waiting for the questions, uh, you know, I hear there's a lot of need for education interest in policy and framing policy and, uh, you know, focusing on that. So there are a lot of areas that we heard as part of the solution. And one of them is having panels like these where uh, the, you know, community leaders' voices are, could be heard. And I think this is a great initiative, uh, which has been truly educational, at least for me, to understand these terms and, and put them into context. Um, and more importantly, hear these stories from, you know, from, from people, you know, the, that communication that happens in here is something we should do more of. And uh, we can see that reflected in uh, the thoughts. We have some comments uh, here. Thank you, Dr. Roy Ball. Um, Thank you. Yes, we're, we're all learning a lot from this, um, uh, from this uh, panel discussion. Um, so 
let me ask you this. So especially, uh, let me ask Lan here. What are your thoughts on how can minorities or anybody for that matter get involved into and try to understand policy? How, how can you do that? How would you start? Tell us about your journey. How did you start this? Wow. Um, so originally I was going to go for medical school. Um, and um, when I got diagnosed, um, I took a year off to go through treatment. But I also realized like, wow, why was it that my primary care physician refused that uh, chest x-ray? Looking a little bit deeper um, into those policies. I think for me, it really started with just a question, um, asking more questions and how in the end, uh, a lot of times it's policy, you know, why was it that my grandfather had to um, give up his treatment um, and because he was a green card holder, there's nuances to that, of course, but I think it was so tied into the curiosity about how it impacted me. And then later on seeing that it wasn't just me, it was multiple community members. It was other communities of color that also felt the same impact that I was and why it really pushed me to run um, and go for as a, as, a, as a politician because seeing how much policy impacts us all, even if we don't exactly see it, um, and how it is that we can learn uh, of other communities' history. It's also in policy. So, you know, I think that just um, starting with our kids, um, posing that and just telling them and, and really um, indulging into their curiosity, you know, um, and not just our kids, other community members who may not know the history or want to know a little bit more. Granted, I would caution everyone to, you know, do that uh, in a respectful way. We don't, one question that we always get that falls into these stereotypes is like, okay, well, where are you really from, right? It's kind of what we're, we were hearing throughout the panel. So, you know, I think that uh, just being engaged and really asking questions, you know, why is it that we only have um, 3% of a certain type of population here? Or why is that, you know, what, how is it that we had internment camps in New Mexico? So just posing those types of questions and digging deeper. Thank you. So I'll open this up to all our panelists. What are some local spaces and resources in Albuquerque or New Mexico community to, commu to connect our partners with the API community? So uh, probably a couple of minutes before we close. I'll just mention there are um, Asian organizations in town, including the New Mexico Asian Family Center um, and I'm on the board of that. Um, so if anybody wants to um, talk to me about that, there's that, there's the Hindu temple, there's the Asian American Association in New Mexico, there's um, Chinese American Association, there's, there's so many Filipino American. Um, so there are associations and there's a UNM um, Asian American Student Association as well. And they're newly formed and that would be a great group for some of our um, UNM partners to connect with. Great, and uh, you know certainly the the UNM uh, Health Sciences uh, Sciences Center for Diversity and Inclusion can um, you know like we you know we can collect these resources and you know so that because we're actually thinking of uh, you know connecting communities I think that's what we're doing right now and this is an amazing effort. Um, <laughs> I was just looking at these uh, these comments. All right, mm -hmm. and uh, there's another question from Dr. Kong. What are what are suggestions for talking about anti Asian hate incidents? What does anyone want to comment on that? Um, yeah, well, so a few things on that. Uh, we have heard again of incidents here in Albuquerque. Uh, which is truly heartbreaking, but for um, bystanders to report it. Uh, one thing that I've committed to here um, as a city councilor is making it easier for anyone to come to City Hall, but especially of our Asian American Pacific Islander community who has been facing um, hate, violence, discrimination, even my own sister, uh, even my own friends being screamed at, yelled at, attacked, 
Um, so reporting is so critical. Um, it doesn't have to be unless it's, you know, an act of violence to call 911. It can be through our Office of Civil Rights, especially if you're facing discrimination. Um, you can also at any time reach out to me um, if you know of any incidences. Um, and uh, one thing that is definitely being felt well before really our shutdown is Asian American businesses uh, that they even shut down or were operating to go they are seeing actually um, a major decline in, in patronage because of this um, scapegoating uh, of the pandemic onto our um, Asian American communities. So that's definitely one thing that you can also do, which is very easy and also delicious um, mm -hmm. to go to an Asian American business to try some ice cream um, outside of your district or area uh, because Right now, our, our communities are definitely feeling it. In terms of just talking about it, talk to your peers. You know, talk, check in with someone that you know is part, that's part of the Asian American community, um, and just see how they're doing. Because as incidents were occurring throughout the nation, we were certainly doing that among our family members. Uh, we were making sure, for example, my parents were not going grocery shopping, not just because of the pandemic, but because I feared that they would be assaulted. Um, so checking in um, and making sure that everyone feels safe um, and are okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Lan. So with that, we are out of time. And I just wanted to thank um, everybody for joining in tonight. This has been a great panel discussion. I thank our uh, panelists for sharing their thoughts and frankly, their life journeys looks like. And on behalf of the UNM, Health Sciences Center, Office, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I thank everybody for joining in tonight. So please stay in touch. We have a lot of events planned for this month. And um, there is that, uh, the, the page uh, that, you know, please look at those events and uh, mm -hmm. do join us. This has been a very enlightening discussion. Thank you. And I do have to thank a couple of people, Meg and Jennifer, who have put in a, <laughs> put in a lot of effort to do that. And in the chat box, you can see that link for the website where you can look at these other events that we have coming up. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.